Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Overland News from Overland Expo. I'm Nick Janes. With me, as always, is Rick Stowe. Let's jump right into the news. There's sort of a shocking report that came out of Motor Trend and a few other outlets. It's that Jaguar Land Rover is walking away from the Land Rover name. It's going to instead promote what are, have been individual nameplates into sort of other brand status, namely Discovery, Defender, Range Rover, and of course Jaguar are going to live on their own, but the Land Rover name is not going to really exist per se. That's because, according to the, the, you know, the brand manager, uh, exactly, let me look at his exact title here so I don't mistake here. Chief Creative Officer uh, had said essentially that people don't say I have a Land Rover, they say I have a Range Rover which makes sense. I mean, Range Rover has been a sub-brand underneath Range Rover, but to walk away from Land Rover altogether is, is really shocking. Rick, what do you think about this? Yeah, I was really surprised when we started talking about this news, uh, but at the same time, I can't disagree. You know, got some buddies that, you know, say the Defender, the Range Rover, so on and so forth. Uh, at the same time, I'm, uh, I hope this goes in a good direction. I, for one, think the new Defender is pretty cool and a neat evolution of that model. Um, you know, like we talked about, there's a lot of shifts happening in the 4x4 world, and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out moving forward if someone picks up those names or one of those names or ever how it falls out. Yeah, in the end. well, of course, Rick is referring to a conversation we had off camera, <laughs> but we'll have that conversation on camera now, too. To me, Rick, I yeah. think Land Rover walked away spiritually from Land Rover a long time ago. I did review the Defender for the Compass a couple years ago when it was new, and it was a great truck, sure, but was it a Defender? No, I don't think so. You know, but in the same way that I felt like the new Star Wars don't really feel like Star Wars either. <laughs> but you know what? I don't, yeah. I'm not in charge of that. Like, I'm not the decider. You know who is? <laughs> Land Rover. I mean, at least they were. <laughs> <laughs> but there's not going to be yeah. a Land Rover anymore. So, you know, what is in a name? I don't know. I mean, Jaguar Land Rover feels like it's sort of been um, knocking on death's door for a while because it sort of lost what it means to be one, either one of those brands. I don't want to get too far because it's an overlanding show. I don't want to get too far off the path and talk about Jaguar too long. But, I mean, my God, mm -hmm. what does Jaguar mean anymore? It used to be sort of, you know, right between, you know, Mercedes-Benz and Rolls-Royce. A little bit higher end and now it's sort of like competing for Acura level quality things I feel like and similarly yeah. Land Rover it really went way way premium and luxury but and sort of forgot the off-road cred I mean they really bend over backwards to prove in every one of their marketing launch videos how off-roady they can still be but I'm sorry when the Defender <laughs> V8 comes on 22s and is drifting you know in its photo it's like forget about it like Close-up shop. Forget it. Like, yeah, Land Rover is dead. Fine. Yeah. Walk away from it. Yeah, you're right. I think outside of the Defender especially, uh, the luxury angle has been pushed so hard that they've kind of alienated the market that the more uh, vintage, romantic nature of Land Rover uh, that you think about with somebody that has a, you know, 15, 20-year-old rig from them. Um I will, on the other end though, I have seen some discoveries like on our on our courses at events and, and they are still capable, but you kind of have to go looking for that. You you don't get that idea just from, from seeing them, you know, on the lot or on the street. So yeah, I, uh, I for one hope that the Defender stays kind of off-road oriented. Uh, I may have a wish list of some people I wish that would pick up the name or names, uh, but uh, I'm curious to see how this happens, you know, moving forward for Land Rover. And I really hope it doesn't go away altogether. That would be kind of tragic given how storied the history is in the overlanding yeah, world. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, if I have to be a real pessimist and look, you know, a soothsayer here, I wouldn't be surprised, Rick, if this is a move by Jaguar Land Rover, who's owned by Tata Motors, to break off some of these brands so they could be more sellable. We don't have to look too far back to when Chrysler did this in 2011 when it broke Ram off of Dodge, and then for a short time thereafter, SRT was its own brand. All of this was to, just in case they needed to sell off some assets uh, to keep the company afloat, they could sell off some of the more profitable arms, Ram being one of them, Jeep another, which was already independent. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if uh, JLR and Tata were more interested in letting go of, say, Discovery if someone wanted it, or Defender if someone wanted it, um, and put some money back in the bank uh, just uh, in order to keep the, the rest of the, the, the brands going. Because, you know, selling all of Land Rover is a heavy ask. Selling 
Defender, not as big a lift. Especially since, again, I think the new Defender isn't really a Land Rover Defender anyway. Uh, especially when we have Ineos Grenadier yeah. coming out, coming out hard. Well, no pricing uh, at around Overland Expo West will be really exciting. We can talk about uh, Ineos in another episode. But, um, you know, everyone pour one out for Land Rover, even if it did die, uh, you know, in, in, in a real sense, it did die 10 years ago. But it's, it's, a, it's yeah. a sad thing. Um, as one brand goes away, another brand rises. Rick, what do you got for us next? Yeah, so we just published on the Compass a really interesting breaking news about the next Silverado HD coming with a ZR2 package. Uh, last year, I got to check out the first ZR2 Silverado uh, out in California. You can check out that review on the Compass. It was a great truck, kind of a neat full-size entry into the very off-road oriented uh, kind of market. And uh, I'm, I think it, it's going to be really neat to see the HD version uh, given that same off-road focus, including like the Multimatic suspension and some of the other features. Um, we see more and more overlanders that are looking to go full size. You know, you get more payload, more pulling power, more cargo room, just all those things that they're looking for. So I think this is going to be a popular choice uh, as it uh, becomes available. Uh, Nick, what do you think about, you know, kind of the stats that we've seen and the features on the HD ZR2 uh, versus the other offerings from Chevrolet. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and as you pointed out, you know, uh, you own the first, you know, the rebirth of the ZR2, the Colorado ZR2. Then we saw the 1500 Silverado ZR2. Now this is the 2500. And that kind of goes right up against um, Ram Rebel 2500 HD, which is new. And then, um, which also, you know, slots right beneath um, Power Wagon. Then we have Tremor from Ford in the 25, or the uh, F250. Um, and that is, is a competitor to this as well. I will say that I think uh, this Silverado 2500 uh, ZR2 is really handsome. I, I think a lot of people have not been super keen on the new uh, HD uh, GM offerings, especially uh, the, the Silverado, but I think this thing is, is handsome as heck. And I mean, with a 6.6 liter V8, be it gas or diesel available, that's pretty compelling. 401 horsepower, 464 torques from the gasser, um, or gasoline, not gasser. And then, um, what is it? 460 horsepower and 975 torques from the diesel. Uh, I think it's a, a pretty compelling package. You add that up with a 10-speed automatic and uh, a rear locking differential. Uh, you've got a you've got a going off road machine. I will say though, Rick, I would like to know your thoughts on how a big heavy duty full size would fare on the trails in your neck of the woods out there in Virginia. Yeah, so that was actually something that was on my mind with the ZR2 1500 when we were out in Joshua Tree. You know, there were a few tight spots, but all in all, much more wide open than something you're going to find here on the Blue Ridge Parkway uh, area or up in Vermont where we're at. Uh, oftentimes in those trails, you find yourself in a midsize and still wanting more room. Uh, so especially on some of the tight turns and switchbacks, and I always say that the trees don't get any further apart no matter how capable your vehicle is. So... Uh, yeah, you know, sometimes it's, it's purely a game of geometry, and uh, I think there will be some limits there, but I can imagine that these are probably going to have some, like, you know, pop-up trailer, or pop-up, I'm sorry, campers, uh, overland trailers behind them. So these will most likely be rigs that are, aren't looking to do super technical trails anyway, but that's definitely a consideration for anyone that might be considering one. Taking a look at that track width, uh, wheelbase, things like that, because uh, there's always pros and cons. Sure, you gain a lot of payload and power, but there are gonna be uh, some numbers that are working against you, depending on what kind of overlanding you're looking to do. Yeah, totally, and speaking of that, um, it's got um, 16,000 pounds of payload for the gas, uh, and that's 3,397 uh, 3, pounds of uh, payload, pretty good. Uh, and then 18,000 pounds of, of towing for the diesel. And, and to your point, Rick, I, you know, I, I drove the, and we talked about this lap, uh, last episode, the. Uh, Bronco Raptor, which is 85 inches wide with those ridiculous yeah. fender flares on it. And I did uh, a, a trail in Oregon we call, it is, well, I don't know if it has a real name, but we call it the 10 Mile Black Diamond because it's a literal Black Diamond trail that is 10 miles long. I did the Bronco uh, Raptor with that and I, I was just squeaking through just everywhere between those trees. 
Um, yeah. and certainly that's wider or just as wide as, as this truck. However, this truck is, you know, what, three or four times longer. So it, it will be the width that comes down and kills you. So I would see if anyone's wanting to shop this uh, for a big daily driver overlanding rig, stick to the desert. I think you'll be better out in Johnson Valley than you yeah. would be in the, the trees of Virginia or Oregon where I live. Um, but otherwise, a sweet rig, and yeah. I'm glad to see finally have Chevy have an HD, you know, sort of off-road competitor to go up against um, Power Wagon, Rebel, and Tremor. But, um, you know, it's cool, and we'll see. We don't know pricing yet, but we'll know that um, as, uh, as it gets closer to on-sale date. Lastly, we wanted to talk about the Overland Experience Pass as we're staring down the eyes of... Overland Expo West, which is going to be May 19th through 21st in Flagstaff, Arizona. And we wanted to promote a really key and special part of the whole series, and it is the Overland Experience Pass. For $490, you can bring your rig and drive with some expert off-road trainers on our custom-built course. What's more, you get premium camping, you get to access up to six classes of tailored instruction for a custom off-road driving skill course area. And any one of these driving instructors would cost you $1,000 a day anywhere else for private training. And you get to have these, these folks walk with you on with your truck and explain to you how to you know, better utilize it off-road. This is so much better than using somebody else's rented Wrangler on some other course because you know your rig and how it's set up for weight and all those good things. And so to me, this is an invaluable course and I'm not, and I'm not trying to really, you know, nobody asked me to promote this on the show. I want to promote it because I think it's such a cool and rare opportunity. There are no other show does it like we do in this case and our, our instructors are awesome. And Rick, I know you've had some experience with these instructors. Can you tell us a little more? Yeah, I've got a couple of friends on the team, but one that in particular comes to mind is I got a chance to do a full day trip actually in Arizona with Nina Barlow. Uh, if you're not familiar with her, you should check her out. She is an absolute legend in the overlanding off-road world. Uh, everything from guiding to rallies and stuff like that. But what really sticks out to me is not only was she super knowledgeable uh, and at the same time uh, kept us safe, but let us have plenty of fun on that trip. But you know, in a few recovery situations, she knew exactly what to do and then instructed us through those uh, because we were in a kind of a different environment, high mountain uh, that a lot of people on the trip had not been in before. And uh, I can't imagine getting to like do a trip with her in your own rig with some like, you know, like you said, walking along instruction. I think it's really helps to uh, see what not only is your vehicle capable of, uh, but also to build confidence. So when you're out on your own, uh, you don't have any question about is this possible or how should I tackle this obstacle? The courses are great. Uh, really, it blows my mind how much they can build into one. And uh, you get a chance to kind of go through a lot of different obstacles in a relatively short distance with some of the best trainers in the world. So like you said, for the price, what all it includes, you really can't get a better deal than this. Yeah, and I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, you don't just go, it's not like a ride and drive like we have with Bronco and we will this year with, no. with Toyota. It's not just driving through, you know, elephant tracks, you could cross axle. This is, you know, you get to learn how to, you know, winch sideways up a hill, you know, your, your huge rock gardens, all of these things. And the director of mm -hmm. training, uh, Chris Walker, uh, out of, uh, you know, BC, Canada, is just an awesome, awesome guy. He's, he's so skillful, so knowledgeable. Um, I was on the Overland Trail Tour with him a couple years ago, and wow, I mean, like, his skills are, are, are next worldly here. And honestly, Rick, if I were honest with everyone, I'll be honest right now, I could probably stand to use to do this course. I mean, I've been off-roading myself <laughs> for, you know, coming on 15 years. And I, frankly, I don't know how to winch uh, sideways, like on a, on a you know, angle on a hill. You know what I mean? I don't know how to self-recover like that. And so uh, frankly, I could, I could stand to yeah. learn a few things or, you know. So I really encourage everyone, if you're thinking about coming to Overland Expo, be it West or any of the other three events, we really encourage you, especially if you're sort of a novice just getting started, even if you're not an expert. I mean, Rick is, Rick's an old time expert and he could probably learn to stand to learn a thing or two as well. So any one of us would benefit from this. And then again, premium camping, you know, classes, all, all the good stuff, and then stories that will last a lifetime. So please check that out uh, on yeah. overlandexpo.com. With that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you everyone for watching. As always, please like, subscribe, and uh, hit the notification button. Let, let, 
Let the internet tell you when we've got a new episode, <laughs> but one will be coming every two weeks near the end of the week. Thanks again for watching for Overland Expo. I'm Nick James.